The bananas you eat, the fish you catch, and even the wild berries you pick, all these might not be as wild as you think. This is the story of how humans transitioned from being hunter-gatherers to food producers, and it's far more interesting than you might imagine. Long ago, before any of us were born, people lived by hunting animals and gathering plants. They moved from place to place, following the herds of animals and the seasons of the plants. This lifestyle, known as hunting and gathering, was the norm for thousands of years, but then something changed. People started to settle down, plant seeds, and raise animals. This shift from hunting and gathering to food production, or farming, didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual process that took thousands of years and involved many small steps. One of the most surprising things about this transition is that it didn't always mean people stopped moving around. For example, in New Guinea's Lakes Plains, some modern nomads make clearings in the jungle, plant bananas and papayas, and then go off for a few months to live as hunter-gatherers. They return to check on their crops, weed the garden if needed, and then go back to hunting. This cycle repeats, showing that the shift from hunting and gathering to farming didn't always mean a complete change in lifestyle. Similarly, the Apache Indians of the southwestern United States would settle down to farm in the summer at higher elevations, and then move to lower elevations in the winter to hunt. Many herding peoples in Africa and Asia also move seasonally to take advantage of the best pastures. This shows that the transition from hunting and gathering to farming was often a blend of both lifestyles. Another interesting aspect is the idea that hunter-gatherers were just passive collectors of wild food. This is not entirely true. Some hunter-gatherers were very active in managing their environment. For instance, in New Guinea, people would clear away competing trees to help sago palms and mountain pandanus grow better. They would also keep channels in sago swamps clear and promote the growth of new sago shoots by cutting down mature trees. This shows that even before farming, people were actively managing their land to increase the production of wild plants. In Australia, Aboriginal people managed the landscape by burning it to encourage the growth of edible seed plants. When gathering yams, they would cut off most of the edible part, but leave the stems and tops in the ground to regrow. This practice of digging also helped loosen and aerate the soil, which is a key farming technique. All they needed to become full-fledged farmers was to take the stems and remaining tubers back to their camp and plant them in the soil. The transition to farming happened step by step. It wasn't a sudden change, and not all the necessary techniques were developed at once. Different wild plants and animals were domesticated over time. Even in the most rapid cases of this transition, it took thousands of years for people to shift from a diet of mostly wild foods to one with very few wild foods. This gradual process was driven by many small decisions about how to allocate time and effort. Foraging humans, like animals, had to decide how to spend their day. Should they spend it hoeing their garden, which would yield a lot of vegetables in several months, or should they gather shellfish, which would give them a small amount of meat right away? Or should they hunt deer, which might yield a lot of meat, but was more likely to result in nothing? People made these decisions based on several factors. They wanted to satisfy their hunger and fill their bellies but they also craved specific foods like protein-rich foods, fat, salt, and sweet fruits. They tried to maximize their return of calories or specific nutrients by choosing the most efficient foraging methods. At the same time, they wanted to minimize the risk of starving. A moderate but reliable food supply was better than a fluctuating one with a high risk of starvation. Some people, especially men, were guided by considerations of prestige. For example, they might prefer to hunt large animals like giraffes to gain the status of a great hunter, even if it meant going hungry more often. Cultural preferences also played a role. Some foods were considered delicacies, while others were taboo. Finally, people's decisions were influenced by their values and lifestyles. In the 19th century U.S. West, for example, cattlemen, sheepmen, and farmers all despised each other. Similarly, throughout history, Farmers have often looked down on hunter-gatherers, and hunter-gatherers have despised farmers, while herders have disdained both. Once food production had arisen in one part of a continent, neighboring hunter-gatherers could see the results and make conscious decisions. Some adopted the entire system of food production, others chose only certain elements, and some rejected it entirely and remained hunter-gatherers. In conclusion, 
the transition from hunting and gathering to food production, was a complex and gradual process. It involved a blend of nomadic and sedentary lifestyles, active management of the land, and many small decisions about how to allocate time and effort. This transition was not a sudden shift, but a series of small steps that took thousands of years. Understanding this process helps us appreciate the ingenuity and adaptability of our ancestors and the intricate relationship between humans and their environment.